Okay, so I decide, well, we're in a uh, Parsha Vayishev, which can be found in Bereshis, uh, Lamed Zion, chapter 37, uh, verse 1, basically. And uh, this week, uh, I've studied a bit of this before with the Sepharno, and I love the Sepharno's commentary. He comes with a, a unique perspective that's a little different than most of what the sages say on the story of what are we learning about the sale of Yosef, right? And so what I like about um, what the Sepharno says, he, he just comes with a totally different twist, a total different perspective than the other sages. And I thought it was really interesting, really interesting of what he says, and I wanted to share it. I'm going to go through a lot of the partial with the Sephardo, a bit of Rashi, and a couple other commentators. But uh, just because the Sephardo is so unique, I thought it would be an awesome study. And so you don't even have to agree with his opinion, but just like Torah, they say there's 70 faces of Torah, so there's different perspectives. Uh, there's different views. So it doesn't mean it has to be this way or that way. And really, it's a story, but Torah is more than a story. It's actually uh, us to learn what, uh, how to connect to Hashem, how to, uh, what is he telling us through this story, you know. So uh, more about the, the neshama and connecting to Hashem and how to serve Hashem. So anyways, here we go. So in Parsha Vayeshev, it starts off, it says, Vayishev Yaakov Be'eretz Megore Avi Be'eretz Kenan. Yaakov settled in the land of his father, sojourning in the land of Canaan. And verse 2, it says, uh, Ele todo Yaakov Yosef. These are the chronicles of Yaakov Yosef. Todo. So the Sepharno immediately begins to comment on this word toldo, which is usually often described. Oh, share is coming in. Sorry, one second here. Oh, Betzalel, Shabbat Shalom. And share is coming in. So, yeah. Shabbat Shalom, bro. Shabbat Shalom. So, um, yeah, what was they saying? So, yeah, uh, toldo is the offspring. It usually translates as generations of offspring. It's used in context of describing the children that a particular person is going to have. That's usually what uh, Toldo is uh, described in his Torah. Shira, Shabbat Shalom. Glad Shabbat to have, Shalom. Glad to have you. We're in uh, Parsha Vayeshev, and I'm just uh, beginning with the commentary on Sepharno. And so, yeah, he brings the... He brings up the, the concept of toldo, and it's usually referring to offspring. But Sepharno, he gives a different interpretation of toldos. And in doing so, he hints on the idea. So he says this. So when it says, these are the chronicles of Yaakov, Yosef at the age of 17 was a shepherd with his brothers by the flock. But he was a youth with the sons of Bilha and sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And so... The Sephardo, he, he mentions, he says, these are the events which are born to him, which happened to him after he dwelt there in Canaan. So he says Toldo is really describing the events that are born to him every day as the episodes and the stories that happened to him after he came back and settled in Eretz Israel. And then Sephardo adds, Sephardo adds that the from the time he left his father's house, originally to go to Haran, everything that happened to Yaakov Avinu when he left Eretz Israel for the first time and went to Levan, his whole experience there, he says this. He says the events which occurred to him when he left his father's house foreshadow our history during the, the first Exile, the Galus Rishon, uh, while the events which occurred to him after he returned to his father's home foreshadow our history during the second temple and our subsequent exile. So he says that these events, when he went the first time to went to Uncle Levan's house, that parallel whatever befell our forefathers 
during the period of the first exile and following the first destruction of the, the first base Hamikdash, and from the time he returned to Eretz Israel to where his fathers had been, from that point on, from actually this parsha and everything onward that occurs to Yaakov Avinu is actually what symbolically happens to the Jewish people later on in history. In the time leading up to and including the second Galus, the, the second destruction of the Beis Hamikdash, so by the Romans, and also foretells the ultimate, he says this also leads up to the ultimate redemption of the Jewish people, which will come at the time of Mashiach. Okay, so this is, he's gathering this all from the word Todot. And so Sephardo, in his introduction of Bereshis, in the book, when he begins his whole introduction in Bereshis, he actually says what happens to the fathers will happen again, which is Maisa Avo Siman Lebanin, which is a, a very common saying uh, in Torah. Actually, the Ramban Nachmanides brings up this whole concept of Maisa Avo Siman Lebanin. Whatever happened to the fathers will happen again. And yeah, Ramban brings this up quite a bit, but Sephardo, he actually adopts this idea from the Ramban and he takes this idea and elevates it to a next level. He goes up to an even greater level. And he says, in particular, everything that happens to Yaakov is symbolic to what the Jewish people will go through. And Yaakov is named Israel. And so what happens to Israel uh, actually happens to the children of Israel. What happens to Yaakov happens to the children of Israel. And so it's not really a coincidence. And Yaakov Avinu goes into Galos twice. He goes into exile twice. Uh, he started off in Israel. And then the next Galos, the next exile to the house of Levan, comes back, resettles in Israel. And then he ends up in Mitzrayim, where he lives out the rest of his days, right? And so this is a sign for what happens to the children of Israel. When he goes into Mitzrayim, this is actually a picture of the Galos of Rome, when Israel would later be in exile of Rome. And so Sephardo says, the life of Yaakov Avinu symbolizes the Geula, the redemption as well. So how, how does Yaakov's life symbolize the ultimate redemption? Where can we find this? Where do we find the coming of Mashiach. And so Yaakov Avinu, he actually dies in Mitzrayim. He dies in Egypt. It says uh, later on at the end of Bereshis, we find, we see that in the last 17 years of his life were actually great. Because why? He re reunites with Yosef and the people of Mitzrayim are all kind to him. He's with his family. All the brothers are back together. Perhaps this is symbolic of the ultimate redemption. But there's another interpretation is when Yaakov Avinu dies at the end of Bereshis. But what happens? His body is actually brought back to Eretz Israel. And maybe this is symbolic of to bringing us back out of Galus, out of exile. And... When I was reading about this, I thought about this in, in Bereshis. If you go to Parsha Vayeki in a, for a minute, or you don't have to, but in Bereshis chapter 50 of Rashi, Bereshis 50 here, let me see, go into chapter 50. Now, this is what I thought about. So when they... In, in chapter 50, verse 10, it says about uh, Yaakov Avinu, they came to Goran Ha'atad, which uh, is across the Jordan, and there they held a very great and imposing eulogy, and he ordained a seven-day mourning period of his father. So we see that what happens, Goran Ha'atad, this is what Rashi says, he says, Goran Ha'atad literally means the threshing floor of the thorn. And it was called this name because 
it was surrounded by thorns. And Chazal expound that it is called by this name because of a great event which took place there. That all the kings of Canaan and princes of Ishmael came to do battle. So there's a famous story in uh, the Gemara and Sota where Asaph is actually arguing with the brothers about the burial spot. And he's trying to interrupt Yaakov's burial. And actually, uh, I did a, a video of this, this story in Parsha Pinkas. And the, the, I think the video is called this Kushim. Kushim is Mashiach. Anyway, Kushim, he, he slices or hits off Yaakov's head. And Yaakov's head rolls into the grave with Yaakov. And, and who is Yaakov and Esau? They're brothers. They're actually twins. And so the head rolls in. And uh, we see that at the end, when Yaakov dies, that this is also the downfall of Esau, which is really the destruction of Rome. This is uh, the end of the Galus. They say that Rome is going to extend till Mashiach comes. You know, and Kushim is really from the tribe of Dan, but when you rearrange the letters, it spells Mashiach, and this is what Mashiach's going to do. And so the picture is also when Yaakov is, is buried, when, when they do this great eulogy, so we see that Rashi says that all the kings of Canaan and the princes of Ishmael came to do battle, but once they saw Yosef's crown hanging from Yaakov's coffin, they all stood and hung their crowns from, from it and encircled it around with crowns like a threshing floor that is encircled by a fence of, a fence of thorns. That's amazing. I think in Sota it says there was 36 crowns around Yaakov's coffin. And so we see that Rashi says the battle was going to begin and then it stops. And, you know, uh, we say in, in the Siddur that on that day, Hashem's name will be one that everyone's going to bow. All Everyone's going to recognize the authority of Hashem. And this is all going to happen when Mashiach comes. And so this is what I believe is what Safarno is saying about a Yaakov. The end of Yaakov's life is also symbolizing the redemption. And we see a crown of thorns, literally a crown of thorns, when Yaakov is buried. What else is amazing about that? They say that Yaakov died there. But what do the sages really say about Yaakov's death? They say Yaakov, Yaakov really lives. He still lives. This is what the sages say. They don't say that Yaakov's dead. They say he still lives, right? And Chazam Cipher says something interesting as well, that Yaakov wanted assurance that he would not be punished for a, uh, an Olam Haba, like in the beginning when it says Yaakov settled, what he, he settled, uh, he wanted assurance that he would not be punished in Olam Haba for the 22 years he had spent away from his father. Here also he suffered a fear on account of his father, another way of understanding Migore Avi, where it says uh, Yaakov settled in the land of his father's sojourning. Thus, this phrase, the father's sojourning, the, thus the 22 years in which Yosef was away, and believed to be dead, atoned for Yaakov's sin in this world, enabling him to enjoy his full uh, reward in Olam Haba. Pretty awesome, if you ask me. And also, Kazam Cipher even goes on and he says, when it says um, in his tranquility, the very word tranquility um hints at Yaakov's intentions. The last two letters of this word for tranquility is so it's Shalva. The last two letters are Vav and He, and are also the final two letters of Hashem's name, which he vowed not to make complete with these letters until Amalek's name is, has been eradicated from the universe. And we can read about that in Shemot 
uh, 17, verse 16, Exodus 17, verse 16, where Rashi even says that the, the erasing of Amalek's name will uh, have Hashem's name be in whole. And so Yaakov's desire to dwell, lay shave, with these two letters intact was actually a desire to experience the tranquility of the end of days when Hashem's name will be complete and his love and mercy will prevail over his quality of justice. And so, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, so also, Safarno carries on this idea of Maisa Avo Seman Lebanim. Uh, later on, whatever happened to the fathers will happen again. Later on in this parsha, actually at the end of Perik Lamed Zion, at the, the end of chapter 37, we, we read about the sale of Yosef. And who did the who did the brother sell him to? Was it the Ishmaelites, the Midianites? So Sephardo writes as follows: the fact that that the brothers sell their brother into slavery is also something that happened later on in Jewish history. It happened to our forefathers in the Bayez Hashani, the second temple. Some Jews sold other Jews into the hands of Romans. This is what he says. A parallel occurred during the period of the second temple when the Jews sold their own fellow Jews to the Romans during the time of the Hashmanayim kings. And this caused the exile, just as the sale of Yosef by his brothers caused the exile of our forefathers to Mitzrayim, as our sages tell us, and in, he's quoting uh, the Gemara Shabbos 10b. So here again, we see the concept of Yaakov and Yosef, what's going on in this parsha, then there's nothing new under the sun, that it, what happened will happen again. And, and in the second base Hamikdash, what did the sages say? That this was all, the second base Hamikdash, uh, it, it was destroyed because of Sinat Hinam, baseless hatred. And brothers were going against brothers. And this happened exactly with Yosef. The brothers had baseless hatred against Yosef. And so the Galos and Mitzrayim came about because of the sale of Yosef. And Sephardo says this is symbolic of Rome, which came about because of Sinas Kinan. We see the parallels. And now, what else makes me think about this? That's not the only time someone else has been sold in Jewish history. This made me think about something else. Does anybody else know who was sold? Anybody, anybody want to contribute or think about that? It was someone else that was sold. Yeshua was sold. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeshua was sold. Who are you talking about? I wasn't sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeshua was sold. Uh, actually, in Matai 26, in the Brit Hadashah, chapter 26, verse 15, what happens? Actually, then one of the 12, whose name was Yehuda Ishkriyat, went to the leading priest and he said, what will you give me to hand him over to you? And they counted out 30 pieces of silver for him. And from that moment on, he sought an opportunity to betray him. So Yosef, what do they say about Yosef as well? That Yosef really represents Mashiach ben Yosef. You know, I think Christians, they mention uh, Yeshua ben Yosef, Yeshua ben David, or they say son of Joseph, son of David. And they, they've they heard, they kind of talk about a concept of Mashiach ben Yosef ben David, but they don't even have the proper understanding of this. I think most Christians just mean, think that means, okay, he was the son of Joseph, literally, and he's Messiah ben David at the same time. That's kind of their, their at least from what I've seen from the church, I don't know. But that's not exactly 
what Mashiach ben Yosef, Mashiach ben David really represent. They represent roles, and Yosef represents Mashiach ben Yosef. And Mashiach ben David is the returning of King Mashiach at the end of everything to, to bring us back to, well, do tikkun of the whole world and bring us back to the proper state. And so, yeah, we see Yosef was, uh, Yeshua was sold. And so here again, this is basically because of baseless hatred. And in chapter 37 of our Parsha, verse 2, it says Yosef was 17 years old and he would actually oversee. Yaakov made him in charge. He, he held him in charge. He would oversee shepherding with his brothers. And he was a young lad. It says an R. It says, Ar. he was a lad. And Rashi says he conducted himself as a young boy. Actually, Rashi says here, um, yeah, he was a youth. The, the Rashi says he would do things associated with being a young boy. He would he would groom his hair, look at his eyes so that he would look attractive. This is what his mind was on. And supposedly he was a very attractive person and everything. And so Yosef was, in, this is what Rashi says that he was doing. But Safarno actually says something a little different. And he, uh, Safarno says because he was a lad, but who are because he was only a lad, he sinned by telling tales about his brothers, for he was inexperienced and could not foresee where this would lead. So uh, Safarno is saying something a little different. He says that Yosef was actually incredibly smart. It says here that he was, Safarno says that he was inexperienced. He couldn't see what his actions would lead to. But he was very intelligent and soon thereafter counseled the elders of Mitzrayim as we read and teach his elders wisdom. And that he's quoting Psalms 105 22. So the Safarno says that when he says he was a lad, he was very smart, he was very, uh, he uh, was very, very intelligent, but he lacked a certain wisdom. And when he went back to tell his father and told on his brothers, Safarno says this wasn't the wisest thing to do. But you can't really blame Yosef because he never had life experience. So this is what Safarno saying that he was very intelligent, but he didn't he didn't live he didn't live a long life, and 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 so he didn't have life experience. Basically, says the Safarno. He did not have the ability to look forward and contemplate his actions. And he was just doing what he thought was right. And even if he was, he never saw the big, bigger picture of the events that would transpire. Right. So and this is what the Shabbos 89B says that there, there is no counsel in the young. Meaning so it it's better to get wisdom from a person that's much older in life that's been through things that a young person has never experienced yet. So young people are incapable of giving advice the way old people can. And, and Safardo also points out in verse five here, it says, Joseph dreamt a dream, which he told his brothers and they hated him even more. And so he, he told his brothers in this, too, he acted with inexperience of youth. That's what uh, the Safarno says. And this is after Yosef's first dream in verse 5. And he says to his brothers, I'm going to lord over you, and you will bow down to me. So he didn't really think about how this would turn out with his brothers after saying this. And, you know, there's a... Uh, so we see about the young boy, Na'ar, and that he was very intelligent. Actually, he was probably um, great in the Torah and, and these things. And, but it shows that he did have a big intelligence. And he had even later, as he goes to Mitzrayim, he's able to counsel the whole entire um, place. But um, this also reminded me of a connection in the Brit Hadashah. Actually, and Na'ar, there's something more mysterious about Na'ar. So the Shanae Lakot, just to come with a different view, he says that uh, 
Tov, the word Tov is 17. And, you know, the first, uh, Yosef was 17 years old and Yaakov loved Yosef. And so we see in the beginning of this Parsha, this first 17 years of Yosef's life was, uh, was Yaakov's best part of his life as well. He loved Yosef and then, and then Yosef sold. And at the end of Yosef's life, another 17 years, we see 17 years again. So the, the gematria for 17 is good. And the Shanei Lachot, he actually says, the Shlach HaKoda says, the Torah adds that he was still in the R, a boy. And he says that this uh, on a different scale is the miniature number is a reference to Hanok, Enoch, which is otherwise known as the angel Metatron who is also called the Na'ar, and whose function is alluded to in Shlomo's Proverbs, uh, verse 20, chapter 22, verse 6, educate the lad in the manner appropriate for him. So we see something a little more mysterious about Na'ar. I'm not going to go and expound more on that, but it's just something that's there that the, say, the, the mystics say, the Kabbalists say. And But I also thought about how Yosef was intelligent at a young age, and it reminded me of Luke in the Brit Hadashah in chapter 19, I believe it is, or sorry, chapter 2, verse 51. And we see that he was with his parents. He came down for the festival of Pesach, Yeshua and his parents, and the, the parents are looking for him, and he, and he, and he says in verse, uh, actually, 50, 51, he went down with him and came to, oh, wait, uh, sorry, uh, we see him in, actually, verse 46, at the end of three days, they found him in the temple, and he was sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. You know, it's interesting that he was sitting with them as well, because even in Jewish thought, uh, we learned that those that sit in the temple had to be from the line of David. And we see Yeshua, even at this age, is sitting. And they're actually, the, the rabbis there in verse 47, it says, All those heard him were amazed by his intelligence and his answers. So we see another parallel, at least I think that was a kind of a connection there with Yeshua again. And then we come to uh, verse 7 here in chapter 37, verse 7. It says, behold, uh, just going to flip over here with Rashi in verse 7 here. It says, behold, it says, behold, we were binding sheaves in the middle of the field. And when behold, my sheaf arose and stood. Then behold, your sheaves gathered around and bowed down to my sheaf. And Safarno, again, it says, he comments on it when it says, my sheaf arose and remained standing. Safarno says in Vagam Nitseva, and also stood upright. And this indicated that his rule would endure for a long time. As in fact, for 80 years, longer than the reign of any Jewish ruler recorded in the Holy Scriptures. So that Safarno says about the sheaf remained standing, that he, this rule, he, he was a ruler and a king, and he ruled unusually long for at least 80 years. Yosef died at the age of 110, and it doesn't even say he was demoted. It says he was basically a ruler and until he died. And so unusually long time. And Safarno has a style where he comes along with an angle that uh, likes to present the, the, the light of the Avos. So when Safarno talks about the fathers or characters in the Torah, especially like the forefathers, even if sometimes if it's, the Torah shows it in a bit of a negative way, he likes to to show a perspective of them in a light way, even if it's in the negative part. For example, now this is, this is what I was really excited to share here. 
because we see in uh, that Yosef's brothers, they sell Yosef. They wanted to kill Yosef. And, and who were the brothers? Who were the 12 brothers? They're, they're Zedekim. They're very righteous. They're actually, they're actually Zedekim. Why? Because the 12 brothers become the 12 tribes of Israel. So they weren't exactly um, evil people. Even though it's presented that Yosef's brothers want to kill Yosef. And, and, and it says, and one of the reasons for most of the sages say, they say, because Yosef spoke Lashon Hara. Yosef spoke Lashon Hara. And so they weren't too happy with Yosef. And uh, it says they want to kill the brother and throw him into a pit or sell him. So this is obviously not good behavior. And these Zedekim, uh, they do this, they do this and it requires some explanation. So in chapter 37, verse 18, look what it says here. They saw him from afar. Uh, let me go to the Rashi because my eyes are kind of bad. Let's see here. It says, yeah, they saw him from afar. And when he had not yet approached them, it says, Vayis, thank you, Vayis Nahalu Oso Nahamiso. They conspired toward him to kill him. But the Safarno on these last three words actually says it doesn't really say what it says here when we're reading in English that it, they conspired toward him to kill him. And he said they expired against, they were conspired against by him that he slay them. And we see this word, the vayis nachelu, they conspired toward him. Uh, the root word is nun kaf lamed, which means to, to beguile, to, to conspire. And we see that Yaakov sends Yosef to check up on his brothers to see how they're doing and watch over the sheep. And, well, Rashi, first of all, he even says, when it says, Vayis uh, Nachelu, they conspired, this means they filled themselves with conspiracies and cunning. That's what uh, Rashi says, but Sofarno comes with a different interpretation with these three words. He turns around the nature of the story. And he says, Vayis Nachalu means they attributed to Yosef a desire to plot against them. That's what Safarno says. It actually, it's re Safarno reads it as if Yosef was conspiring against them. La Hamiso, they said he is trying to kill us. This is what Safarno says. When I read this, I thought this was spectacular i thought it was uh it was such a different kind of twist and it's not like safarno is actually making this up he actually goes through the hebrew and can and and proves in a way that it means like this where did you read this what's that where did you read this it, right here in the safarno commentary bro Oh, you have. Oh, OK. Oh, yeah. I was going to say I never read none of this. in the <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't I don't know if any other rabbis say this, but this so is Swarno, Swarno saying that Yosef wanted to kill them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and you know what? This is this is the part of the, 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 the study that I really wanted to share, because when I when I was reading this a lot of lights were going off in my head because is this a stretch? What if I told you that we can find something like this in the Brick Hadashah? My mind went to the Brick Hadashah, but first, let me show you how Safarno explains this. And so he says the brothers conspired, or I mean the brothers, cons sorry, sorry, when he, it says they were conspired against by him that he slayed them. So Sofarno says that Joseph was planning on slaying them, means to use one wiles for an evil end. And then he says, so he's, he's using this root word in other places of the Torah to show you 
that it actually can mean the opposite, not not the brothers, but from the other side. So if you guys understand what I'm saying, it says, Asher nichalu lachem, wherewith they have beguiled you, Numbers 25, 18. So it's almost the same language, but it's actually talking about the, the opponent, basically. The brothers considered Yosef to be a nochel, one who uses deceit and wiles to harm, even to the point of death. They reasoned he has not come in our interest, but only to find fault or transgression, which he, which he can report to our father so that he will curse us, or for that which we will be punished by God. Then alone would he remain, be, he would be blessed by Yaakov. So they're actually saying not really as in literally killing or murdering them, but he's saying that he's he's being conspiring, he's 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 plotting on how to end their to bring destruction to them, not not like from a weapon of him, but by by going to Yaakov that could cause them to be cursed for their actions and even uh, by God because of the Lashon Hara. They 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 accused him of Lashon Hara, that the brothers thought that Yosef was intending to kill them. And so whatever they did is because of what they thought Yosef was going to do to them. This is what the brothers were really reasoning within themselves. And is this a stretch? Well, we're going to see more evidence of, see, the Sephardo even says that they were Zedekim, that the brothers were righteous. And they thought Yosef was going to harm them. And so we see later on in this piece, we see the brothers saw Yosef as a rodaif, which means someone who pursues after someone else, basically to go kill them. You know what? This actually makes sense because Lashon Ara it actually equals death. When you speak Lashon Ara, it's like you're invoking death. So it was almost like they figured that he was he was going to kill them in a sense. Yeah, yeah, and and this is what you find almost all the sages say that Yosef was speaking Lashon Ara. Although I'm going to come with an opposite opinion uh, from actually uh, Zerushim Shon just to to just give a different thought on this because almost all the sages say he was speaking Lashon Hara. But first, so the brothers, it even says the grammatical Hebrew from the word Hispael, uh, it's a reflexive verb. It's applicable to thought and imagination as well as action that which has an impact upon one's designs and plans and, and Safarno even gives more of an examples of why he says this. He says, Ata mit nachesh, uh, ben nafshi. You are setting a trap to harm my soul. And he quotes 1 Samuel 28, 9. And he says the word, so, which means he, they went, uh, he went to kill them, to slay them, means that Yosef wishes to slay his brothers as we find and now he's going to another verse in Devarim 4, 14 with similar wording, la'as la as so chem osam. Devarim 4, 14, la'avarach, la'avarecha la uh, bevrit, uh, that you should not, you should enter the covenant. So he's showing these words about not really saying you, but to them. Like he's, he's saying that some, in the English it's spelled like, that they wanted to kill him, but it's really worded as, as meaning him to them. I don't know if I'm explaining that too well. The Sparno does a better job. But anyway, we are being told by the Torah that the brothers were convinced that Yosef was beguiling and deceiving them with the intent of destroying them in this world or in the world to come, or in both. And they felt justified in slaying or selling him. So first of all, you know, when it says, Safarno says that Yosef was going to slay them. You know, some people say, well, may say that that is ridiculous. That's no way, no way Yosef was going to do this. But you know what? I thought of a verse in the Brit Hadashah 
that anti-missionaries like to use. And if you go to Luke chapter 19, verse 27, I'll read even on before it says, uh, Yeshua says, See, I say to you, everyone who has, it will be given to him. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And then it says in verse 27, but bring here those enemies of mine who rejected me from ruling over them and kill them in front of me. You guys hear that? Yosef tells his Talmudim, go get my enemies, bring them in front of me and kill them in front of me. Have you guys read that before or even seen that in the Brit Chadasha? Yeshua is telling his Talmudim to kill his enemies right in front of him. And the anti-missionaries will point this out and go, wait a minute. Yeshua, your Messiah contradicts himself here. It said he's telling his disciples to kill his enemies. But doesn't Yeshua say in other places to turn the other cheek? that blessed are those that forgive their enemies, all this kind of stuff. What are we doing here? Yeshua says, kill my enemies in front of me. And this, when Sephardo tells us about, um, about Yosef plotting to kill his brothers, Sephardo doesn't even say really this is literally, he says that, this could be brought about, but um, this made me think of this passage with the Brit Hadashah, and what is it really saying? Say again the verse that Yehosh. So, yeah, Javier, uh, it's uh, chapter Luke, chapter 19, verse 27. So, Yeshua says, yeah, I'll read it again. It says, but bring here those enemies of mine who rejected me from ruling over them and kill them in front of me. I bet you most people don't, when they read the gospels, probably that flies right over them. Maybe, I don't know, maybe not. Maybe they don't know what he means. But what is going on? You see, Yeshua said, I came, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And, you know, the sages talk about what is the Mashiach going to do? He's going to slaughter the Yetzirah. And his battle, especially Mashiach ben Yosef's job is to battle the Yetzirah, to subdue the Yetzirah, kill the Yetzirah. We see Yeshua riding on a donkey. The sages say that the Mashiach will ride upon the donkey, meaning he will have control over the Yetzirah, the materialism, all this stuff. And so when it talks about slaying my enemies, you know, there's a passage in uh, the Psalms as well, the, the David, he says, he actually prays that Hashem kills his enemies. What is this talking about? The sages say it's not really literally killing the enemies, but killing the Yetzahara, the evil within them. This is the job of Mashiach, that those that stand before Mashiach will be convicted and he will slaughter their evil intentions, their Yetzahara, what is causing them to sin. And you, so, so this is the connection, I believe, is such a great connection to what Safarno says here. I don't even know if you can find anywhere else, maybe, except for like the Psalms and everything. But what Yeshua says, bring my enemies before me. And, and it connects so well with what Safarno says. And this is what makes me believe Safarno even more. I love the perspective. And so Yosef was really plotting on destroying their bad behavior now were they zedekim or not were they were they sinning or not was was yosef really speaking lashon hara you know the talmud or the the anti-missionaries they're kind of acute what's the one thing they accuse yeshua of they actually there's some that quote the talmud as if they try to plot it to yeshua even though it doesn't really say anywhere about Yeshua, but it's, they, they contribute the sin that Yeshua did, that, they, that he cannot be Mashiach is because he spoke Lashon Hara. Yeshua spoke Lashon Hara. Where do the sages get this idea? In the Brich Hadashah, Yeshua calls 
the, the Parashim, the rabbis, the leaders, he says, your father is the devil. He, he talks back and he's bold with them. And, and what do the sages teach? That we're not to go against the authority. Going against authority is like going against God. But you know, was Yeshua justified on this? Was it Lashon Hara? Now the sages say that Yosef spoke Lashon Hara, but there is a different view. And I was reading in uh, Zerah Shumshon, it says, however, our Abba interprets Yosef's words differently. As he holds that Yosef's opinion that he wasn't speaking Lashon Hara at all. And this is what it says. On the contrary, his final, that his final status as viceroy proved that his initial status as a slave was not intended as a punishment. As he emerged from prison to reign over Mitzrayim. And this is what Yosef was telling his brothers. You hate me because you claim that I spoke Lashon Hara about you. And I know that you will therefore cause my father to say an evil beast about him. What page? Oh, sorry. Uh, Shira, it's uh, a page 408 in Zerah Shimshon. And this is fascinating. So the Araba says, actually, the ones who spoke Lashon Hara were really the brothers, not Yosef at all. What did the brothers do? They went and lied to Yaakov. They said an evil beast devoured him. This is Lashon Hara, and it caused his father much pain. And it says, for we learned in the first chapter of Tanis 8, which we are studying, it says, in an explanation of the verse, if the snake bites because it was not charmed, then the speaker has no advantage. Kohelis 10, 8, 11. In the future era, all the animals will approach the snake and say as it follows, a lion claws its prey and eats it. It benefits. A wolf tears its prey and eats it. It benefits. All animals attack only in order to sustain themselves. However, what benefit do you derive from biting people and killing them? The snake. What do you gain? You just bite. The snake will answer. So too, the speaker of Lashon Hara has no advantage. He who harms others through Lashon Hara derives no benefit from that either. It just causes destruction. And, you, and there's another interesting point that the Zerah Shumshon says in uh, page 404. It talks about the binding of the sheaves that I was talking about that arose and remained standing. It says, Me alamim alumim. Uh, and Zerah Shumshon, what's going on here? I'm sorry. Oh, someone's trying to get into the Zoom. I don't know what's going on. Anyways, okay, so, uh, yeah, Arshim Shon, uh, Zerashim Shon says that when it says in the middle of the field, the, the, the bind, we're binding sheaves, alumim, in the middle of the field, when behold my sheaf, uh, it says, alumati, arose and remained standing as follows. Rav Levi, Ar Levi said with the words, Alamim alumim, we were binding sheaves, which can be interpreted to referring to elalim elamim, means mute idols. Yosef indicated to his brothers, even before the fashioning of Yeravam's golden calves, you are destined to make mute idols, the golden calf, the eagle zahav in the wilderness. And to proclaim to this to the people, this is your God, O Israel, more Lashon Hara. And our Abbas said, Yosef was indicating you were destined to conceal matters concerning me before our father. And after selling me into slavery, deceive him into saying an evil beast devoured him. So we see a whole other spin. Most of the sages say that Yosef was speaking Lashon Hara, but it was actually the brothers. And you see, they, they also... If it wasn't Lashon Hara, the, then they would understand it wasn't when Yosef rises up, becomes king. And this shows that everything was authorized by Hashem. And that was actually truth. 
Yosef was actually speaking truth. And that's what Yeshua was doing as well. He was speaking truth to the leaders at the time, and which had Sinachinam. And so I thought that was something I just wanted to add from the Zeris and Shon, just to give uh, Yosef a little bit of a defense with a different perspective. And so, um, yeah, the brothers thought that he was actually coming to kill them, though, a road death, which which the, the halakha, we have the right to kill him first. So how? It says, the halakha says that um, they felt justified. See, they felt justified. The, the brothers actually felt justified in, in slaying or selling him to prevent him from slaying them. So the brothers didn't feel guilty about this at all. As the Torah teaches us, he who comes to kill you, arise and kill him first. That's in Sanhedrin 72a. And that's something I'm definitely prepared to live by, especially in these days. Someone comes into my home, I'm not going to hesitate. You know, so... Uh, this is the brother's reasoning that they they actually felt right in their manner because they felt that Yosef was actually out to get them. Okay. And we see here also 40, chapter 42. What am I reading here? 42. What do I put? 42, 21. If we go, yeah, later on, we find that all the Shavatim, the, the tribes were, they were Zedekim. Uh, we find the brothers never regret to what they did to Yosef. So if we, in the next Parsha, in chapter 42, verse 21, it says, they said to one another, indeed, we are guilty concerning our brother inasmuch as we saw his heartfelt anguish when he pleaded with us and we paid no heed. This is why this anguish has come upon us. So what did they feel guilty about? They didn't feel guilty about trying to kill him or trying to or throwing him in a pit or even selling him. They felt guilty about never listening to his Please, they ignored his pleas. This is what they stated. They thought he actually deserved it, but the reasoning was they should have had a little more compassion in the manner in which they did it. They, they, what they were thinking of, they were guilty of more was they could have handled it in a different manner. They could have like instead of throwing him in a pit, just straight up selling him or these things. But they heard him crying which showed that they didn't have any compassion. And that's what they felt guilty about. They didn't feel guilty about selling him or even trying to kill him because they felt they were actually justified. Uh, we see in chapter 37 of verse 19, it says here, and they said to one another, look, that dreamer is coming. Behold, this dreamer comes. He intentionally told us his dreams to provoke us to take revenge on to him. So as to make us sin against God or our father that we might perish. This is their thoughts. And then uh, we see in verse 20, it says, come now, therefore, they encourage one another to prepare to kill him. And we will say an evil beast devoured him, lest our father become angry and curse us. And then the Sopharno says, and we shall see what becomes of his dreams, the dreams he told us, which foretold that he would be a ruler over us. And now we will be proven false and they will be as nothing discredited and unfulfilled. And also he was the youngest brother. And you don't really, the Torah teaches us that even the younger brother is supposed to really not talk back to the older brother. They're, they're, they're learn from them and even respect their elders and these things. And it says in verse 20, what will become of his dreams? Rashi actually says that they weren't the ones saying this. It was actually the Ruach ha HaKodesh that was saying this, the Holy Spirit, which is uh, pretty interesting. And then 
in verse 25, we see more of how they thought they were justified in what they did. As in verse 25, it says they sat to eat food. They raised their eyes and they saw, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Galeed, uh, their camels bearing spices, balsam, and lotus, and their way to bring them down to Egypt. So Sepharo even uh, adds, it says, and they sat down to eat bread. In their eyes, they had done no wrong, nor committed any sin, which, have, which would have deterred them from sitting down to eat a meal. For a righteous person who feels he has done wrong refrains from eating. As we find when the Israelites slew the tribe of Benjamin, as it is written, and they sat there till evening before God had lifted up their voices and wept exceedingly. And they said, O oh, Hashem, God of Israel, why is this come to pass in Israel that you can find in Judges 21 verses 2 and 3? So we see that they sat down to eat and and Sephardo says they were Zedekim, so it didn't bother them. They didn't feel guilty at all. They they felt like they did the right thing, and that's why they, they had no problem having a meal and everything. They felt like they did the right thing. Again, because according to Halakha, if someone is coming to kill you, you take action first. And this is what they looked at Yosef as, as a road date, someone per, per, uh, pursuing them. And we see that... He also go, gives another example. The reason the brothers felt no remorse is because they considered, yeah, Yosef to be a pursuer. And they pursued, and the pursuit is permitted to save himself, even if he must kill the pursuer, if there's no alternative. So that's what the Sephardo says. And going on in verses 31 and 32 of the chapter. It says here, they took Yosef's tunic, slaughtered a goatling, and dipped the tunic in blood. They dispatched, so it says they sent the fine woolen tunic, and they brought it to their father. And they, we said, we found this, and identify if you please. So it, first it says they, they, uh, they sent it and brought it. It's almost... Two, two words that doesn't even make sense. They sent, they sent it, and then they brought it. How does this even make sense? And so Rashi says something interesting here. And the Sopharno. Sopharno, when it says they sent it, and then they brought it, he actually says that they cut the coat of many colors. They gashed it. They tore it with a spear. They, they pierced the... The coat of many colors, they gashed it. And uh, Rashi actually, he actually says that uh, in verse 31, chapter 31, going back to chapter 30, or wait, 37, 31, sorry. 37, 31, Rashi actually says here that they took up the male, the male of the goats because they slaughtered a goat because it resembles that the blood of a man. So Yaakov was like an expert in looking uh, at the blood of different animals and he can tell where the blood was from, but the goat resembles so closely to that of a man, which is another amazing concept that Rashi says here. And Ketonet Pasim, so, in 37 verse 3, Katona uh, Pasim, it says in chapter 37 verse 3 that now Israel loved Yosef more than all the sons since he was a child of his old age and he made him a fine woolen tunic. Katona Pasim uh, is a Rashi even says that this is a combination of Karpas. Karpas is what we have on the center plate on Pesach, Karpas. And what do we do with the Karpas? We take it and we dip it into, some dip it into vinegar, some dip it into water and salt, and they dip it, and they pull it up and it, and it drips, and then they dip it again, and they dip it twice. Some say this rep represents the tears of Israel coming out of Mitzrayim, but uh, Karpas, even Rashi says right here, that this can mean cushion or padding of wool. And it, it represents that 
that w uh, the journey of a Jew is sometimes not always that comfortable. And basically that no man has a place to lay his head, which sounds just like Yeshua. And also the Vilna Geon, uh, actually the Karpas, the Kaf has a, a Nikud in the center of Kaf representing like a last Kaf, like um, a final Kaf. And the Pei as well has a Nikud in it representing the final, which really represents Mashiach ben Yosem, Mashiach ben David, and the dipping can represent death and resurrection and all of these things. So we see, and the goat, and what does Yochanan say in the Gospels? Behold, some people say it means the lamb of God, but really say in Hebrew can mean goat. Behold, the goat of God, which also represents um, taking away sin and these kind of things. So a little bit of interesting things there. And before... We leave the chapter, I don't know, uh, but I think it's relevant to mention about Reuben and, and Yehud, Yehuda. Yeah. On verses uh, 21, 22, when Reuben, the oldest or the firstborn, the oldest says, uh, I'm translating from Spanish, so okay. bear with me. No problem. Uh, trying to free him from their hands say don't let's not take his life and he added reuben do not uh uh spill blood right right i i believe we were discussing last night that maybe reuben was doing tikkun for for the sin of why he was disinherited or taking the, the first one blessing being taken from him so maybe that's a that's a thought that maybe he was trying to correct that but also I think it's relevant on verse 26, then Judah, Yehuda, said to his brothers, what profit are we going to gain by killing our own brother? Let's just hide uh, oh, and hide his blood. So I believe Yehuda is also, his action is prophetic uh, in the sense that Yosef, like you mentioned before, is, is, an, is an image of, of uh, Mashiach ben Yosef. So there's something there. I don't know the depths of it, but uh, him intervening for his brother, actually these two for different, uh, um, for different intentions, uh, but I think it's relevant. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. There's, there's a ton with Reuben as well. I didn't really focus on Reuben in the study, but uh, they're definitely, the sages have a lot to say about him as well. A ton. But yeah, he was definitely, he definitely uh, merited some, some good things, especially because he stepped in and basically told his brothers, let's not kill him, you know. And uh, also, this would, he didn't want to do this um, because, just trying to think here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot there. I don't want to say anything uh, off of just in case I forget or say things wrong. But yeah, there, there's there's a lot there that the rabbis discuss about Reuben as well. There's there's so much there. And uh, yeah, uh, in uh, verse just 37, what is it, verse... Five or what is it? 30, 35. Um, oh yeah, in, in chapter 37, verse 5, it also says, I mean 35, it says, All his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to comfort himself and said, For I will go down to the grave mourning for my son. And his father bewailed him. So we see that, what does Rashi say about this? Uh, 37 verse 35. Um, yeah, according, according to Rashi, yeah, he didn't want to be, uh, he says, I will be buried in my morning. I will not be consoled. Uh, 
he basically says that this is out of my control. Like he didn't want to be consoled because he says basically a Shem kind of almost programmed him this way to not be consoled. And that he kind of didn't really have a conscious effort to, to be consoled. It was kind of out of his control and which is interesting. And, uh, he says, I'm going to go down to my grave like this. And it says his father cried for him. And Rashi says Yitzhak would cry because of the agony of Yaakov, but he would not mourn for he was aware that Yitzhak was aware that Yosef was alive. And But Sepharno actually says in verse 35 that he did have a conscious effort, but he chose not to be consoled. He chose not to be comforted. Uh, which, which is really devastating. He says that this would have effect on Yaakov because of keeping away the Shekinah, the divine presence would stay away from Yaakov. And the sages say that if we're in a, if we are sad and, and depressed, this is not a way to serve Hashem and that this, we quench the Shekinah. Really, it'll leave us because we can't serve Hashem. We're to always have joy. Even what is uh, Yaakov, or James, the book of James, saying that even in times of trouble in and all of these things, that we are supposed to count it all joy, that we're still to have joy. And so, yeah, that was some interesting things that I thought were amazing in Safarno. And then we come to chapter 38. Mm-hmm. You guys still want to keep going? <laughs> oh, yeah. Chapter 38, all of a sudden, it it switches gears. It switches complete gears. And we were learning about the story of Yosef. And then it comes all of a sudden to the story of Judah. Okay, and maybe it's coming. It comes into the story of Judah and Tamar. And uh, again, Sofarno has some some points on this, but now I, I wanted to jump into the Ramban Nachmanides and share what he had to say, because this is a whole different twist. So we see in chapter 38, it says it was at the time uh, that Yehuda went down from his brother. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, Libya. It says Hi. You- it went down from it. We're just discussing uh, Genesis chapter 38 here. It says, okay. It was at the time that Yehuda went down from his brothers and turned away unto an Adulamite man whose name was Hira. And there was Yehuda. There Yehuda saw the daughter of a prominent merchant whose name was Shua. He married her and came to her. She conceived and bore a son, uh, and he called his name Er. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. And yet again, she bore a son, and she called his name Shela. And it was in Chaziv when she bore him. Just going to read so that in case we didn't read this, we can get the whole picture. And it says in verse 6, Yehuda took a wife for Er, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. But Er, Yehuda's firstborn, was evil in the eyes of Hashem. And Hashem caused him to die. Then Yehuda said to Onan, come to your brother's wife and enter into the Leverite marriage with her and establish offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the seed would not be his. And so it was that whenever he would come to his brother's wife, he would destroy it on the ground so as not to provide offspring for his brother. What he did was evil in the eyes of Hashem and he caused him to die also. Actually, Sephardo does say something pretty amazing. I just just remembered. I don't want to miss this. Sephardo says that now we we learn about Yehuda's uh, sons. You know, the daughter of Shua died. Judah should have brought his daughter-in-law into the household of in place of his wife, as Abraham had done, as it says. And Yitzhak brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother. Uh, back in chapter 24 verse 67 Tamar was therefore abandoned of hope of ever remaining part of Yehuda's family but we also see that um, uh, Yehuda has two sons and they die and 
Why is this? Safaro so says this has to do with Mita Kanegan Mita. What did Yehuda do to Yaakov? He told him that his son would die, his dead, Yosef. And so Safaro so says this is Mita Kanegan Mita, that two of Yehuda's sons would die because of the action Yehuda did, which is kind of mind blowing if you ask me. And so, and then it, it goes on here and it says, Onan did, did not, he, he said that the son, he knew that the seed would not be his. How could the seed not be his? How could the seed not be his? Why would he think this? And it says in verse 11, then Yehuda said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he said, lest he also die like his brother. So Tamar went in a, and lived in her father's house. So the Ramban Nachmanides, he comments on this. And I'm just going to do a little bit here. And it, it says in verse 7, so he quotes verse 7, and it says, but Er, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the eyes of Hashem. Why? Scripture did not mention Er's sin. As it did not concern, it didn't concerning his brother Onan in verse 9. He says, uh, however, it did say that he died for his own sin to inform us that his death was not a punishment for Yehuda for the sale of Yosef, which was Judah's idea. So, this is what the Ramban says. And he says, for the merit of the of his rescue of Yosef from being killed, counterbalance balance, the sin of selling him. Uh, so yeah, in the footnotes, Ramban answers that heir's wickedness is mentioned in order to intimate that Yehuda was not deserving for punishment for his leading role in the sale of Yosef. Then he says, although Yehuda instigated the sale of Yosef, he also was the one who prevented his brothers from leaving Yosef in the uh, in the pit to die. For this reason, he was never punished for his part of the sale of Yosef. So hmm. Ramban and Safarno come with two different opinions here. And anybody got anything to say before I go on? I'm talking a lot. Anyway, so Ramban offers another reason for the scripture's mention of heirs' wickedness. There was no case of a father bereft of his child in the household of the patriarchs, except for this one, this case involving Er as well as Onan. Uh, as it says in, uh, who was evil in the eyes of Hashem. For the offspring of the righteous are blessed. And this is why Yaakov mourned for his sons uh, many days, as refused... Uh, as we, he refused to be comforted. So for besides his love for Yosef, the matter of Yosef's supposed demise was considered by him to be a great punishment to him since such things were unheard of in his righteous family. Shlomo, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. We're discussing chapter 38 with the Ramban Nachmanis. And so um, it says here in... Ramban quotes uh, going on in verse 8. It says, Then Judah said to Onan, Consort with your brother's wife and enter into a Levite marriage with her. So this is the concept of Yaboom, right? And so Onan's marriage to Tamar, an established offspring for deceased heir. Ramban begins by citing Rashi. The son born to Onan by Tamar would be called by the name of the dead man heir. So what Rashi is saying that since the brother died, uh, that the heir died, now Onan takes over, that his son, Rashi says that the son gets the father's name. That's what Rashi says. So when uh, the concept of Yaboom, so if the father dies, then the brother marries the, the, the widow so that she can continue to produce, produce children. And Rashi says this means that the son um, gets the father's name. But Ramban disagrees with Rashi. He says, no. And I'll, he, he says, this is not true. He says, for also in the Torah's commandment concerning Levite marriage, it is stated it shall be that the firstborn that she bears shall succeed the name of his dead brother. 
so that his name may not be blotted out from Israel. This is, you can find this in Devarim 25.6. It says that the son's name carries on so that he will not be blotted out. The father will not be blotted out of Israel. So Rashi means that as in literally the, 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 fa the deceased father, the, the son gets his name. But Ramban says, no, that's not what this means. And he says, then yet the lever is not commanded to call his son by the name of his deceased brother. No, he says, and here's a proof. And concerning Boaz, it is written, furthermore, I have acquired Ruth the Moabite, the wife of Malchon, who actually, Malchon, which, who died as a wife to establish the name of deceased in his inheritance. Because who is actually Boaz to Ruth? That's actually her uncle. That's the brother. So the name of the deceased not be cut off from among brethren and from the gate of his palace or of his place. That's quoted in Rambam quotes Ruth chapter four, verse 10. So yet when Ruth bore a child from Boaz, they called his name Obed and not Mal Malon, which uh, Ruth's deceased husband's name was. So Ramban points out the Rashi, you're incorrect. And he says, he raises another objection to Rashi. He says, He says, furthermore, it says, Onan knew that the seed would not be his. It was, and so it was that whenever he would consort with his brother's wife, he would let the waste go on the ground. Now, what evil did he think would befall him if his son would be named after his deceased brother to the point that he wasted seed from before Tamar rather than risk fathering a son? What was this evil? Furthermore, scripture did not say Onan said, but said instead Onan knew that the seed would not be his implying that he had clear knowledge about this, that the seed would not be his. What does this mean? And Ramban now presents his own interpretation. However, the matter involved here is a great mystical concept. So now Ramban, he doesn't really spell it out, but what he's really hinting at is the concept of Gilgul, uh, especially for some in the group that say, I don't believe it in it and everything. But Ramban, he's actually one of the <laughs> you know biggest- You know we were talking about that last night. Oh, Baruch Hashem. The possibility that he's the Gilgul for, um, was it the, um, one of Jacob's two other sons, the one that spilled seed. Um, I forgot his name, but. Um, yeah. Um, er. Right. Yeah. Uh, Ramban's going to go into that. So, yeah. yeah. I read it last night. I just read what you're reading right now last night from the okay. Ramban. Okay. And he presents two interpretations. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's actually kind of fascinating. I went through the Safarno earlier and uh, with uh, chapter 37, and now we're in 38. And I think the Ramban's commentary, this is actually a pretty, uh, actually not many people focus on chapter 38 too much, but this is fascinating what the Ramban says. So he says this has to do with Gilgul, and he's going to prove this, that he says, uh, his own interpretation says, uh, however, the matter involved here is a great mystical concept, uh, concepts of the Torah pertaining to the genesis of a human being. So he says this is, uh, he's hinting to Gilgul, and it is discernible in the eyes of those who can see, to whom God has given eyes to see and ears to hear. So he says those that study Kabbalah, basically, that will understand this. This is what he's saying. And he says the ancient wise men even knew before the Torah was given there is great benefit in a leveret marriage performed by the brother of the deceased. So he says, even before the Torah was given, when uh, the Torah tells us that the, 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 the wife of a deceased husband can marry her brother, but that's a later on after the giving of Matan Torah. But the Ramban says the, the fathers actually knew about this even before Matan Torah. And it says, and that he is the one who is most appropriate to have precedence in the performance of this marriage uh, with the widow of the deceased. So the next closest in the family. So he says for any relative who is related to the deceased from his family, who is a potential heir to the deceased property, brings a benefit to the deceased when the relative marries the widow. 
So the ancients, they had this knowledge. They followed this practice even before the Torah spells it out. And it, it could be the brother or a father or a relative of the family marrying the wife of the deceased. And so in Bereshi's Rabbah, the Midrash quotes that the sages say that Judah inaugurated the precept of Levite marriage. So, oh yeah, Andrew, you got your hand up. Sorry, bro. Yeah, sorry. Just before we go too far, uh, with your boom, doesn't it have to be agreed upon though by both parties? It's actually yeah. So it, it it's a it's a mitzvah really for the brother to to take on this this uh, responsibility. But yeah, it, they both have to agree. And we Ramban's also going to talk about that that if the 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 brother doesn't agree that what happens, she takes off her, the shoe and, and spits on the ground in front of him, uh, clearing that it's not her doing this, but him. And, and that, that she will be allowed, I believe, to uh, marry another individual. Yeah, but, that's right. Yeah, I remember that. So wouldn't him spilling the seed sort of kind of in a way like as like a protest like he had, you know he didn't he didn't want to do it sort of you know what i mean yeah and you, you see but there's a thing in the torah right now the, because the the torah hasn't been given halakha was a little bit different meaning that the wife could marry the the brother the almost any of the men in the family but then the torah after matan torah it it says no longer as a woman allowed to do that only the Torah says is she's allowed to marry the brother, but not the father, the cousins or any of these things uh, because, but the Torah still said the, the, the widow could marry the brother because why, why would the Torah allow this still? Because it's a mitzvah and it's not just to marry the brother. There's something deeper that the Torah knows. And it's about carrying on the Gilgul, the Neshama, of this deceased so really yeah um onan spilling seed was bad because he was actually destroying a mitzvah he the brother the reason why the brother was still allowed to marry because he had the strongest connection i mean the brothers almost it's almost like they have the same soul this is why the the brother continues to do this mitzvah because it's almost like almost the DNA is very, very similar where the child will literally be the Gilgul of the, of the, the deceased. And, and, and it's a little distant with the other family members. This is why the Torah allowed the brother to still be married. So Onan spilling a seed uh, basically kind of was destroying this mitzvah. And there's a whole concept that the Ramban's not talking about, and I, I know a little bit, but I'm not going to go into detail about this, but the soul on the other side kind of lingers along in everything. And this has to do with also the shoe and, and these things. So in a way, it was a sinful act that he was doing. And, and Ramban continues to explain about this concept. He says, now it is considered great cruelty on the part of a brother when he does not wish to perform the Levite marriage for the sake of the dead brother. And people call him derisively, the house of the one whom Shu was removed. Devarim 25.10. The deceased has become permanently removed from them through the Levir's refusal to take the place. And it is fitting that this commandment, the Khalitsa, the ceremony of removing the shoe and so yeah the original neshama taken away prematurely can actually live in another body this can can bring about gilgul the neshama so the brother was still allowed and this concept was before the torah the soul can go into one body into another and this is what rambam saying this is the secret of yaboom gilgul the soul of the brother lives on and Onan, they say, became lower than the animals. The body is the shoe of the soul. It's the lowest part. The shoe is like the body. It protects the soul. Actually, even that's why we, 
there's even a, a little bit of a hint, the sole of the shoe. The shoe protects our feet from getting hurt when we walk on the ground. It protects our body. Soul is the body protects the neshama with the journey in this world. And so, yeah, the this is all about uh, the earliest times. This would be an act of geul that the brother would be actually redeeming. And, and so this is what the Ramban Nachmanidi hints at. And so I'm not going to go into greater detail on that because it, it can get really deep with the mystical aspects and all of that. But that's just a little part of the Ramban Nachmanidi's. The Ramban has a lot more. I'll stop recording here, but we can continue to discuss and talk about Torah.